In 1972, this N1500 model video recorder cost around £500. It contains the important elements of any domestic video recorder. A clock timer and tuner so you can record unattended TV programmes. It is easy to set up and use and takes video cassettes which are simple to change. Also in 1972, this 1500 model cost around £800. It contains many important elements of a modern family car including crumple zones, excellent road handling, disc brakes, alternator and easy to use gearbox. But that a new family car cost around £800 while the video cassette recorder cost around £500 says something about how wealthy you had to be in order to buy a video recorder in 1972. Recently Tecmoan did an interesting video about the V2000 format but he couldn't do the earlier VCR format from Philips because he couldn't get hold of a machine. Well I can't compare myself to Tecmoan but I do have VCR format machines. Actually there are three variants of this format. The original VCR for which the first machine was the model N1500. The format is often referred to as N1500 and would record up to an hour or so. The next was a long play version, VCR LP. For this the most popular machine was the N1700, so VCR LP is frequently referred to as N1700 and would record up to about two and a half hours. Finally a rare variant from Grundig known as SVC for Super Video Cassette or SVR for Super Video Recording, this could record up to 4 hours. The first model, the N1500 you just saw, is not my favourite machine so I don't use any of those. I run all VCR tapes on modified versions of the later N1502 model. I will show you examples of all three formats in working order and also show you the insides of many of the machines. I'll also show you how to dismantle and repair a cassette and a design flaw in the cassettes themselves. It should be said that running tapes on this format is not always as easy as just putting a tape in the machine which, the, which may be some 45 years old and expecting it to work first time. The machines can need careful cleaning and maintenance and sometimes needing a bit of tweaking to play a particular tape which may have been recorded on some other machine many years ago. This is my preferred machine, the N1502 model. Let's have a look at a few of the features. We have a mechanical tape counter, the deck controls which are all nice and easy to use, start is play and wind is fast forward. This is a tracking control. Stop motion when engaged that means that when you stop the tape it will give you something attempting a freeze frame which can be fairly good. Behind this panel here we have the clock setting controls and the clock actually has a battery backup feature. There's a panel in here where you can put a PP3 battery and that will retain the time in the event of a power failure. You have an 8 channel analog tuner. There are the preset uh, controls for that. You see that one. Set of preset controls. Very typical of what you'd have found on a Philips um, TV of the vintage. Right, let's switch it on. So we switch this to on and we'll immediately get, after a few seconds anyway, something resembling a freeze frame. Let the servo settle for a moment. If I press start, which is play. And what brings the Avro you na achten? After a few seconds, we get a reasonably good picture. The brothers Hammond, die het onderling niet eens zijn over het Midden-Oosten project. En televisier magazine met actualiteiten uit de wereld van vandaag. Avro, Nederland 2, 5 voor half 9, na reclame en journaal. Switch it off and let's take a look inside this machine. Well I've already undone the screws at the back here, I can remove the top. Now actually we can get better access still because the cassette carriage comes off very easily on these machines. Reject. You do have to remove the tape and it means it's quite hard to see the head drum while the tape is playing but look how easy this is. You put your finger in there and there's a small metal 
spigot you push down that's on the other end of the spring and the whole of the cassette carriage comes off. You do need to be careful that you don't clobber the insides of the cassette carriage against the head tips because that would destroy the heads and then you have a real problem. So looking briefly here we have a very large head drum with two head tips. We have the supply and take up spools which are mounted one above the other. Capstan, pinch roller, audio control head. Now one thing that rather sets this format back is that back tension is not very well controlled. That's to say the amount of pressure that it applies on the supply spool during playback. On most video recorders there's some kind of tension arm or occasionally a dual motor system but on this machine the back, back tension is provided by uh, some bushes that sit in here there's a bush that applies pressure and there's some felt pads that alter how stiff this is as it rotates and the trouble with that is that as the tape progresses through the uh, speed of this alters depending how full the spools are and that effectively changes the back tension from the beginning of the end to the tape there's no regulation in there so that's not ideal and it, it can create issues with either insufficient back tension which causes the picture to uh, bounce around and break up or excessive back tension which as well as causing head wear can cause the tape to just stall or squeal and, and stop and, and not play well so setting the back tension by the matter, matter, uh, matter of fitting these shims in here is a bit of a hit and miss affair however it works well enough for the most part the whole machine is designed to be very easy to service uh, and actually if I power this machine down I can show you underneath this board let's pop that open so you can see the rest of the mechanism here this is the loading motor there's a couple of variants this is a, a noisy one with a, a gearbox in here there's another version that has a worm drive which is quieter. Here are some of the um, sub panels. I think we've got capstan servo is in here. And you can unplug these. I'm not going to unplug one now because this machine works well and sometimes it can be fiddly to put back. So we're not going to disturb the machine that works so well. This section here is a lot of the uh, video processing and tuner and Beneath here I have mounted a small piece of Vero board which contains audio video output, uh, mainly video output, preamplifier, so that we can take the output out uh, rather than use um, the modulator which goes via an aerial socket, which would have been the way it was in its day. There was a model of this called the uh, N1512 that included the audio video input and output circuitry. Right, let's see if I can uh, reassemble this. Unfortunately, I can't show it to you working terribly easily without the cassette in there. Right, this is always a little fiddly because this can fouls on some of the deck and it needs a little bit of gentle refitting. There's a part here which is a kind of a graphite block which provides the earthing for the top of the head drum. So this needs to be in good serviceable condition. Refitting this needs to be done with a certain amount of care. I will run it with this lid off, but you don't see an awful lot because everything's covered up by this. But I'll do that just so you can see something. The cassettes, the front lid has a habit of popping up. You just push it down before you insert it, and then it pops up about there. It'll be better when it's switched on.
I'll just rewind it. I think I've hit a bad moment of tape there. So let's rewind it. So this pinch roller gets pushed in towards the capstan there. And that switches it off. Now you can imagine how rare these machines are, uh, but I have two. This is my second one, which is a slightly later model. It has the worm drive type um, lacing motor, which is a little bit quieter. It has a detachable figure of eight power cable rather than the captive power cable of the other one, and has some detail uh, changes in electronics as well. Um, and as you can see, this one works fine too. <laughs> Koffie drinken is pas echt koffie genieten. Met een klein scheutje Friese vlag goudband. Dat was zo, dat blijft zo. En als u nou morgen toch Friese vlag goudband koopt, let dan op het etiket. Er staat een gouden voordeel op. Het is nieuw. Zo, so hier we hebben een very similar N1700 format video recorder. Gone is the freeze frame option because the different heads wouldn't allow for um, an easy um, freeze frame on this format. But otherwise it's very similar. Some of the controls are laid out a little bit differently. There's an eject button here. The tracking control is now a slider which is probably a little easier to use. Let's fire it up and see what we get. Oh, and, and so there we have N1700 format video recorder Richard working very well. Tragedy for Australia, absolute tragedy with a misfield there. The old rule of never run on a misfield still holds good. So we can stop the playback by pressing this twice, once to switch off, and then once again to take the tape out. So you can imagine how uh, N1700 video recorders are, given that this was probably less popular than the N1500 type format. But uh, I have a second one of these machines too, and you can see it playing All quite nicely here. Lloyd, with a score on. And here we have the final iteration of the VCR format. I never know if this is called SVC for Super Video Cassette or SVR for Super Video Recording. It came out only from Grundig, Philips didn't support this format. It does allow for much longer recording times, up to four hours on one of these tapes. Now it has some interesting features. It has a proper seek tuner, as you'd expect on later equipment, rather than the uh, twiddly controls that you had on the earlier 15 and 1700 models. And it has soft touch controls, which would allow for remote control operation, and some variants of this, I believe, did have that option. It has microprocessor controlled deck, as you'd expect on a more modern video recorder. So it treated the tapes more gently than the earlier models. Let's uh, switch this thing on and uh, see how it goes. Now, some of the buttons are rather strangely labeled. Rewind, fast forward, playback, all do what you'd expect. But stop really should read pause and cassette should read stop. But being Grundig, you expect it to be a bit strange. Right. Go for play. Quite a nice smooth operation. And a few seconds later, we get fairly good results. Georg Danzer kommt. Dankeschön, Georg, fürs Kommen. Sehr gut. Georg, gut. Stop. If we hit stop, we have something resembling pause. Let's try rewind. It sort of leaves some kind of image on the screen during rerun and fast forward. And fast forward. It all works rather well. So the real stop button is the one labelled cassette. Then we have the option to eject the tape. But before I do that, I want to show you this. 
That's the original price sticker for this machine. It says £299. So this tape will play for four hours on this machine, 150 minutes on uh, an N1700 format, and 70 minutes on the 1500 machine. Now you're going to want to see inside this, aren't you? OK, let's see what we can do. So let's show uh, the SVR 4004 working. So we'll have switch it on and press playback. So the mechanism here is very similar um, in terms of the deck layout to other VCR format models, but uh, there are some seriously different mechanical components in here because this is not uh, driven by um, so much uh, mechanical logic, it's driven more by electronic logic. It's a very smooth operation. And we'll... Uh, switch that off. Power it down. Now when I first received this machine there were several faults. The biggest initial fault was underneath the head drum there's a circuit board and on there there was a tantalum capacitor that had gone short circuit and it was dragging down various supply rails. Debugging that was a bit difficult because even though I had the circuit diagram a lot of the wiring diagrams for the power supply over here were incorrect and it's all written in German and my German's not that good. So it was a bit difficult to find that but eventually once I replaced that capacitor the machine ran but there was still no picture and that's because the tape was running much too fast and I forget now because it was some years ago which of these panels was the Captain Servo uh, controller but there was a failed um, IC on there. It was an op-amp IC which had failed. So I replaced that, and then there were just a few minor things to fix. Now, it's interesting to see here, there's a bodge board fitted by the manufacturer. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that does, some sort of signal processing. And here, you'll see that I've added a board which provides uh, video output to the sockets which are at the back. It's not as simple as just picking up the video feed to the modulator. It needed uh, amplification. So uh, this board here uses the same circuit, basically, as uh, boards I've added to the N1502 and N1700 machines. So that's the interior of the SVR4004, one of the rarest video recorders on the planet. So having said that the SVR4004 is one of the rarest machines in the world, uh, here's another one. This one's come straight off my pile. I've never tried this. I've no idea what to expect. I'm almost scared to do this, but I'm going to switch it on and uh, see what happens. Power up on an isolation supply to be on the safe side. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's disappointing. Absolutely nothing, not even a clock. Shall I check some fuses? I'll do that quickly. Funny looking fuse. It's all corroded. Well, I've never seen that before. Anyway, shouldn't be a 13 amp fuse in a video recorder. Let's bin that and replace it with something else. Nice new 3 amp fuse. While I'm here, I'll check to see if we can read any resistance at all um, in the uh, input to the video recorder power supply. We should see a high value resistance. Thirty ohms. Well, it might be right. Seems a bit on the low side to me. Still nothing. Should we check the fuse again, or check that we've got <coughs> that input resistance there? 
life will be so much easier when I get a bigger workshop. Right, let's see what we see across here. Thirty odd elms is still there. Hasn't blown any fuses, but still no output. Oh look, we have some life. So the clock isn't working. But we have something on this display. It's gibberish, but I'll take that. It's doing more than it was a moment ago. Shall I pop a tape in there and see what we get? Okay, I have a tape. Let's try something. Haha, uh -huh. nothing at all. Well, it was too much to expect. I'm sure this machine has power supply issues. Better switch it off. So, while we're looking at a few of the video recorders that are on my to be repaired list, we have this interesting machine. It's the model N1520. Mechanically, it's very similar to the N1500. Though there are some differences. Um, it lacks the tuner and timer and gains editing facilities. So this has got four heads so it can do insert editing and stereo sound in 1973. That was uh, quite something. I've not looked at this machine at all. Um, I've, I'm sure the belts have turned to a horrible goo, which they tend to do on these machines. It will have servo faults. It will have a problem with the lacing mechanism because these things always fail on, on this type of deck. So that's another project for one day, um, but still an extremely rare machine. Before I finish with the N1520, I should show you that this one has a standard IEC power connector rather than the uh, one that requires this very strange plug as used on the N1500s. Alex, could you just pass me that video recorder, please? Heavy. Here's the inside of the N1500 that uh, I showed you earlier. I've never taken this one apart before. It's pretty filthy. It has a sticker on the side saying it was serviced in 1980. That might have been the last time it was ever serviced. Here's the very large head drum, cassette carriage, two motors. Of course we have the clock, the deck controls, the tuner presets with the tuner there. And I'll turn it upside down in a moment, moment and we can have a look underneath. There's a lacing mechanism here which includes a wire that can be troublesome. It's a first generation machine so these motors here are driven by mains frequency and then there's a clutch system with some magnetic braking underneath. The servos are quite an unusual design, at least they're unusual to me. They seem to have ramps with needle pulses in them and such in the service manual. Quite difficult to debug. I did try to fix one. Okay, here's the underside. As you can see, there's a lot of wiring. Oh, and a dead bug. Nice. I'll get rid of that, shall I? Well, it is a wooden video recorder, as you can see, so perhaps I shouldn't be so surprised to find a dead wood louse in here. Now, I've slackened off a couple of screws so we can open the PCB here and fight our way through all this wiring. There are supposed to be some drive belts in here and as always they have turned to a horrible sticky goo. That's completely normal. Uh, is to be expected for these machines. Here is one of the eddy current type braking systems. So you can see this large disc here and there's a, a coil there that applies a magnetic field to this which slows it and there's another one here. So that's how the servos operate on this machine. So this would be the head drum servo and this would be the capstan servo. 
you can't quite see the PCB in much detail here. There's a very good reason I wanted to show you this. I've seen it said that this machine was built entirely with transistors and that there are no ICs in here at all. And that is wrong. It looks like there are a lot of transistors, and there are, but there are ICs. They're just not in familiar DIP packages. So if we take a closer look, we'll see. Let me find one here, for example. You can see that. Small round thing, looks like a transistor, but has lots of legs. Looks like it has about eight legs or so. So that is an IC. And there are others in here as well. Look at this fuse mounted up here. It's um, not really designed for high volume manufacture, is it? Awful lot of hand wiring, and these wires can break. It's not, uh, not really a great design. And I've mentioned before, the servos on this are a little um, difficult to diagnose when things go wrong. So, though it's a marvel of its time, it's not a machine I particularly enjoy working on. I don't find that they give the very best results. I much prefer the N1502 model that came later. So it's uh, not something I expect I'll ever repair this particular machine. However, they do share the same heads. So they're still worth getting hold of these, for me, I find, because I can take these heads out and fit them in an N1502 model, which uh, is, has better, in my opinion, better servos. I'm going to put this back together now and uh, stick it back in my pile of uh, scrap machines. Here we have the underside of the N1502 machine. I've uh, more or less undone these screws here so we can have a look at the uh, easy to access part of the underneath which will give us access to most of the deck. Now, I'm used to seeing clips here. They've either been snapped off or weren't fitted. I suspect not fitted on this particular model. They just relied on the screws. And then you have access to the underside here of the power supply. And on the 1702, I do remember having changed an IC on this power supply once before, which failed and took out some of the supplies. It's a rather nice design here. You push against some springs and then you can open the power supply out of the way and gain access to the deck. So here we have the capstan and its capstan motor and the bottom of the head drum which is connected by Allen screws to this pulley and I see here that the belt has dropped off so this belt needs replacing. That belt is actually quite hard to change, it's a little bit fiddly getting your fingers in there and hooking the belt around the pulley on the motor and this um, pulley here. A little bit fiddly but uh, if you fit a good belt it shouldn't keep falling off so that'll be fine. So it's uh, a much more lightweight design than the N1500, it runs on these DC servo motors. Occasionally I've known these squeal um, so occasionally they might need replacing. But uh, all in all quite a nice design, I quite like that. Now I really need to tell you something about the tapes themselves. So here we have some. This is LVC120 means it was primarily designed for use with the VCR LP um, or N1700 format machines. Uh, but it could still be used on a uh, N1500. It'd run for roughly half the time. The tape starts on a spool on the bottom and winds its way to the top which is unusual. So you only see the take-up spool. And on the side here, there's a sliding door. The capstan goes through here. The pinch roller presses against this. So that pushes the tape, pulls the tape, this way up onto the take-up spool. Now, this cassette here is the Super video cassette with a longer playing machine, even longer player. And they look very similar. This one's had the door removed. Actually, this is quite a common problem that people would have to repair the tape and then get into kerfuffle trying to put the door back. 
So the spring is there, but the door itself is missing. That won't stop it from working, but it's clearly not very tidy. People sometimes also get this tape on the wrong side of this guide. If they have it on the inside of the guide, then the machine doesn't really run, run very well. So it's important to assemble it correctly. And I'll show you how to assemble one of these in a moment. Now, the other thing is, this tape is specifically designed so that it can be used in the Grundig SVR 4004 and similar. This tape can't. So what's the difference? How can the machine detect the difference between these two tapes? Well, it's quite subtle. This machine, which is loaded with chrome dioxide tape, which can make the longer play recordings, has a small extra component here. There's an extra plastic actuator there, which is missing from the earlier format of tapes. Without that, the tape isn't suitable for use with the um, SVR format machines. Another tape I'd like to show you here is head cleaner tape. So if your head's fouled, you could put in a head cleaner tape, which contains the white sort of abrasive material, not that dissimilar from what you'd have seen in a VHS or beta head cleaner tape. I actually prefer to clean the heads by hand, but using head cleaner sticks and alcohol, this sort of head cleaner stick, but these aren't particularly easy to get hold of anymore. But these um, are a great way to clean the heads to a high standard with suitable care. Now, let's take a look inside this cassette. I'll show you how it works, how to dismantle it and reassemble it, and also show you a design fault on this uh, and what tends to happen when things go horribly wrong. Some of the tapes have flat blade screws, some of them, like these, have um, posi drive or Phillips type screws. So we're going to be using a flat blade screwdriver. There's four screws to take out. Now, I would recommend, if you're doing this, that you either remove the label altogether or slice it in half, as I've done actually with this one. Because if you leave the label on and try to angle the tape up in such a way that you don't disturb the label, uh, it can make it harder to reassemble and you can actually make a mistake reassembling it. So I would recommend taking the label off or splitting it as I've done here. Right, so we'll take the screws out. Now, this slidey door thing can be troublesome. We'll take the top off. Why have we stopped? Maybe I didn't undo one of the screws properly. Yes, one of the screws is still stuck. Big in his mistake. You're right. <clears throat> Here you can take a, see the take-up spool. Here's the door which causes so much trouble. So there's a spring at the bottom of the door and it connects to this guide. The whole guide can pop off as well and the door connects this little um, hook there you can connect the spring to. Try not to lose the spring, as I've done on the past. OK, let's take the tape apart. You can see this is the surface that touches the tape, the head. So this is the recording surface here. And as is typical on VHS and Beta, for example, the recording surface is on the outside of the tape when it's uh, in the spool. That's the take-up spool. Here's the supply spool. And what's strange about this is the tape runs the other way on this. So now we have the recording surface on the inside of the spool. That's very unusual. OK. There's the cassette with two guides. We'll put this tape out of the way for a moment and just to show you this door thing. So this whole guide and door can come off with the spring. You need to refit this if it falls off. And you've got the spring correct if it does that and it closes on its own. There's a 
mechanism to stop the spools from turning when they're outside of the machine. So if you see where I'm putting the screwdriver, I'm pushing against some spring-loaded brakes there. So when you refit the spools, it's best to try to drop the spool in first at this edge and then push on the brake. But you can always release it. If you finish up with the spool sat on top of the brake, as does happen, you can release it by putting a screwdriver in there and pulling it, allowing the spools to drop down. Let's reassemble. And then I want to show you why there's a design flaw in here. So I'm going to drop this tape in that way. And this needs to go over the top of that guide. Now then, what's a design flaw? Well, it's a little bit hazardous having the tape feeding into the supply spool here, right above the, sorry, feeding into the take-up spool right above the supply spool. What can happen if the machine, for some reason, doesn't manage to take up the tape as fast as the pinch roller is providing it, this gets stuck for some reason, or in the reverse situation, if you're in rewind and this tape doesn't uh, get taken up quickly enough, what could happen is that the tape from the top here can droop down into this gap when it's inside the machine. And if this happens, bear in mind that this spool at the bottom is spinning, the tape can get dragged around underneath in this area and finish up there. Then if rewind is selected, it gets grabbed by this tape as it's feeding back into the spool and eventually just jams up with all your tape crumpled up in a heap. This is a fairly common problem. I've often had these tapes sent to me with just that problem. So I've had to dismantle the tape and untangle the mess and sometimes splice the tape. Remember I said earlier you can have this problem that you can sit it on top of the brakes. I've just managed to do that very thing. So I'm just going to pull the brakes out of the way, let the tape drop, the spool drop down there. Perfect. Now if you get into a terrible kerfuffle and you can't put this uh, door back on, don't worry too much about it. It's not the end of the world if the door's missing, but this guide here, that is important. That does need to be right. Let's reassemble it. Now this is why it's good to cut this label or remove this label because if you're trying to do it like this and reassemble it sort of hinged from the tape at the bottom you're going to get into a mess. You want to be able to drop this straight down like that and lining up this sliding door. Perfect, everything's gone in nicely, the spools are floating, that's perfect. We can now do up the screws Being careful, of course, to drop the screws into their slot. Don't drop one down into the brake hole there. That would uh, make a bit of a mess of things. You'll have to take it apart again and fish a screw out. Now, something I have seen happen on occasions is that the plastic that makes up the um, teeth, if you like, here on the spools, I've seen an occasion where this plastic has broken up and these are starting to fall apart. Uh, if that happens, you may have to put it onto another spool because you can get to the situation where it can't turn the spool. 
So that tape is now ready to go back in the machine. Nothing wrong with that. This particular tape, you might just about be able to see if I can get the light on it just right. Let me just try to do that. You can see there's a line on the top of the tape there. So what's likely happened is this machine's been played in a, this tape has been played in a machine which had some, very often what can happen is if a lot, lump of grot or something has been left behind on the tape path, it will score the tape. I'm not saying that couldn't happen in other video formats too, but the uh, VCR format seems particularly prone to that problem. So cleanliness is everything with these, especially I find with the N1502. You really do need to keep those machines clean. It's true of the 1700s too. Keep those guides clean uh, because otherwise you can score the tape like that. If you do that, you'll get a line on the picture, uh, which doesn't tend to really go away much if you rewind and play the tape, it sort of stays there. So that's the cassette. It's quite a bulky affair. In itself, it's reasonably robust, but you do have this problem with the tape drooping, potentially due to a fault in the machine or sticky tape or some other reason that the tape droops from the top spool down to the bottom. A more common problem can be that the tape just doesn't play. And this can be caused by the tape being sticky. It's called sticky shed syndrome. And what happens, there's quite a complicated or quite a long tape path on this format because this is all drawn out. This tape gets drawn out. It doesn't get played there. The tape gets pulled around the head. It's got quite a lot of static lower drum to, to press against. And if the tape is sticky, it will tend to jam on that lower drum. So you can get the situation where a tape just won't play or it won't fast forward or won't rewind. And very often the solution could be put it into a baking process. On one of my other videos, I've shown you what I call my pasty oven. Uh, which you can bake a tape in for a number of hours, say 24 hours at 50 Celsius. And that can help, not every time, but it can help to make the tape more playable. Right, so there's a cassette. That brings us almost to an end of my explanation of the Philips VCR format. It should be noted that a VCR machine cannot play VCR LP or SVC tapes, nor will the later machines play the earlier recordings. There may have been one rare model from Grundig which could play both VCR and VCR LP tapes, but this was not widely available. The SVC or SVR format from Grundig was pretty much dead from the start, so only the one machine was made. Anyone that says that Beta was a failure should look at the disaster, which was SVC. As far as Philips were concerned, the VCR format was replaced by V2000. As far as the rest of the world were concerned, it was replaced by VHS and Beta. Machines were still to be seen around until the mid-1980s, when most people had moved on to the more modern formats. I hope you enjoyed this and have learned a few things about the first domestic video cassette recording format. Please do remember to like, share and especially subscribe and then I can carry on making more videos about audio and video technology. Bye for now.